All right, let's welcome in our guest, a very special guest, ABA legend, NBA legend, NBA Hall of Famer, uh, every superlative in the book, Julius Irving, Dr. J. Dr. J, thanks for coming on. Hey, it's my pleasure, and uh, good to meet you. I think we've probably been in the same room a few times, maybe All-Star Weekend or whatever, but nobody's brought us together just to, just to say hi. You know, I've admired you for a long time since your Duke days, and uh, you just keep on rolling, man. you you like Father Time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like Father Time is finally starting to slowly beat me down, to slowly. <laughs> we, I can't remember. I don't know if it was in our, when I was in Orlando or when I played in Philly, but I know there were a couple times where you were at a game and you were briefly mm-hmm. in the locker room after one of our games, and I got a handshake, but we've never <laughs> – We've never sat down for a proper convo, so this is a this is a real treat for for me and Tommy and, yeah. and for our listeners, and we appreciate it. Uh, you know, one of the one of the things we we're, we're having you on for, um, you know, Converse uh, and the ABA are celebrating the 45th anniversary of the final season of the ABA, and uh, Converse is releasing a special edition Birth of Flight Pro Leather. I, was that the shoe that you that you played in back in the day? Uh, I did play in the pro leather. Um, most people would call them Dr. J's, even though they had pro leather <laughs> inscripted on, on the side. And uh, I, I did play in that shoe. I mean, I played in a canvas shoe uh, when I was in college. And uh, the transition in the ABA the first year, uh, I think I was still in my canvas shoes. And then the ABA became the official league of Adidas. So everybody put those on uh, for a year. So there's still some old photos out there from 1971, you know, wearing the competitor's shoe. And in 72, Converse decided to sign me to a contract. So uh, I've, I've been a Converse guy ever since then. And I'm happy to see them, you know, making a nice comeback in sports and in uh, lifestyle. You know, they've never left the lifestyle pose but i was a little disappointed when they when they left basketball but now that they're coming back sounds pretty good for for a guy like me who started playing basketball in the 90s i never had the luxury to play in canvas sneakers um <laughs> and my, oh, my, my 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 father <laughs> yeah no Can, what was what was it like like playing in those shoes how different was it did, did you did you feel a difference when you switched over to 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 adidas and, and then converse well i'll tell you what i can I can go back to uh, my middle school days and, you know, living in New York, you know, shoveling snow and and doing odd jobs, you know, to get the money to go down and and buy a pair of canvas uh, leather shoes. They were probably somewhere between two and five bucks, whatever. So uh, that was something I, I put on rain, snow, sleet or hail and grew up in. So in terms of the, the change to, to go to a leather shoe, uh, you know, there was a suede shoe at that time. <laughs> so there was leather and there was suede and, you know, both of them were significant significant upgrades uh, from the canvas shoe, but, you know, the canvas shoe was, it was still always close to my heart. You know, when I played in the Olympic development program, and, you know, we went to Europe and played the Russians and the, the uh, Finnish team and the uh, Polish team, I, you know, I had my canvas on. So I, it was something I, I got used to. And, and you know, I, I think your body acclimates to the uh, the rubber sole and the, you know, the canvas uh, protection. And something John Wooden used to always tell his players to do is sit down and learn how to lace the shoe up properly so it gives you the total support. So I was I was an aficionado in terms of getting the best support possible from that shoe. So I never never messed around when it came to lacing them up. Sat there and took the two or three minutes to get them laced up the right way. When did you when did you feel like the uh, the shoe became sort of synonymous and sort of part of basketball culture? Because you were obviously one of the godfathers of this and. It you know it happened in a window. You had already started playing before this had happened, and then all of a sudden we get to the '80s and it's there. So did you have a specific moment where you sort of woke up and you were like, "Okay, the, the sneaker culture is is really here now"? Um, I think you know when I used to watch Bill Russell play, 
and he had the low top, uh, the low top shoe playing and the black Converse and, and the green <laughs> Converse or whatever. Then it, it, you know, those, those were moments and those were impressions. Those were images. Um, and so that has never really, never really left me, you know, I mean, I think the, the, the resurgence of shoes as collector items and the, you know, the, what do you call it? The shoe tron or whatever, you know, the, <laughs> where people actually take their old shoes and trade them in for new shoes or whatever. So sneaker con, you know, sneaker con is, is something up for the 21st century, clearly. Um, but in the eighties and nineties, you know, shoes were a big deal. I mean, it, it became such a big deal that it was a, it was a, a prize possession for someone to get from a player. And sometimes, you know, the last few years that I played, 84, 85, 86, 87, you know, we, we kind of started wearing the shoe, you know, one practice, two practices, wear it one game, and then give it away at the end of the game, you know? Um, so I think when fans really started collecting players' shoes and players were willing to give them the fans, you know, that really created the explosion. A lot of uh, a lot of people realize that uh, you you played in the ABA, but yeah. uh, a, lot, a lot of people don't realize how you ended up in the ABA over the NBA. You were a college superstar, one of the few players I think ever, if not ever, to to average twenty and twenty in college. Um, mm -hmm. But there was, I think, I, from my understanding, there was a unique rule in terms of the hardship rule that allowed mm -hmm. you to leave UMass a year earlier to make it to the ABA. Is that correct? Uh, sort of, you know, the hardship rule came in after I became a pro. So the NBA did not have a hardship rule. And, uh, after my, uh, junior year, um, you know, had a, had a good season that ended in disappointment going to the NIT and losing to North Carolina by like 35 points or <laughs> whatever. And, uh, Every time I see George call, he reminds me of that. <laughs> I'm like, come on, George, you won one game, one game. There's only one game. Uh, but uh, I, I had an uh, agent uh, come and seek me out uh, through some of the uh, advisors that I had from high school. And I go to this, you know, secret meeting in Philadelphia at the, uh, the airport motel. <laughs> And I'm sitting there with uh, Al Bianchi, who was coach of the Virginia Squires, and Johnny Kerr, who was general manager, Red Kerr, of the, uh, of the Squires. And Earl Foreman was nearby on the phone. How's it going? How's it going? How's it going? And, and, we, and we started talking, and they explained to me, you know, what was going on with the, with the ABA. I had heard about the NBA. Uh, I'm from Long Island. They had a team in Long Island. They had the Nets. Rick Barry played for that team. And, you know, he was a true superstar in, in both leagues or whatever. So uh, after the first day, you know, they piqued my interest. And in day two, um, you know, they offered me a contract. And, you know, the contract was, you know, for a college kid, uh, 125 a year for four years. So the five hundred thousand dollar contract, and I, you know, my, my my mom was probably making six, my dad was probably making seven, <laughs> so the two of them together were making thirteen thousand dollars, and and suddenly, uh, you know, there there was there was a a um, created hardship <laughs> associated with, you know, just staying pat, going to school for another year. And, you know, being a, a full-time student, part-time athlete to being a full-time athlete and, you know, to, to my credit, I become a part-time student because I, you know, uh, still pursued my degree after becoming a pro and took a little while to get it, but I had promised my mom I would. So, so I ended up getting my degree from the University of Massachusetts. There's been books written about the ABA. Um, I'm sure there's been some documentaries from from your perspective, what were some lasting memories of the experience of playing in the ABA? Um, I mean, there was there was a team in Kentucky, there was a team in Virginia, there was teams that 
were in places that you know don't have professional basketball franchises anymore. What was what was that experience like as a player? You know, it was great, guys. Um, it seemed to be a, a truer extension of um, college career. Um, you know, by going to UMass, you know, Northeastern United States, we never we never really left the no Northeast. Uh, so we weren't able to get a significant rating in terms of having a national presence. And the fact that we played in the NIT instead of the NCAA tournament, the NIT was a more prestigious tournament than it is now because there were only, you know, 16, 16 spots. So in the NCAA had, I think, 34, uh, it was less than 40. So, you know, so you're really talking about top 70 teams in, in the country to, to be invited to those tournaments. And, uh, and, and when I went to the ABA after uh, UMass, uh, the, the thing that happened my last two years um, was the dunk was taken out of the game in order to try and neutralize um, Lou Alcinda, AKA Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You know, they, uh, they took the dunk shot out of the game one year, which was my sophomore year, and then my junior year, uh, they took it out of the warm-ups. <laughs> so you weren't allowed to dump the ball in warm-ups. So this was the NCAA, you know, putting their hand in and 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 obviously uh dunking was a you know pretty good part of my game, uh more so than three point shooting <laughs> or whatever. So 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 uh so when it was taken out of the game, uh, and I still averaged, you know, twenty eight points, twenty rebounds, whatever those two years. Uh, when I signed with Virginia, it was like having the chains taken off, you know. So this, that summer, I played in the uh, New York Pro Summer League, which was called a Rucker League, and uh, got a lot of confidence from going there and playing well and having the crowd support and the community support and the whole deal. So when I went down to Virginia, man, I was I was like amped up. I mean, I was like you know six foot five and a half. And, 190 pounds or whatever. And I was like, where are the big guys? I want to go in on the big guys. I, I can dump the ball now. I want to show, show what I could do because I hold it with one hand, move it from side to side and, and uh, you know, put on a show. So, um, so the ABA, you know, with George Gervin, who came in the next year, Artis Gilmore, who was a great player, played for the, uh, the championship against UCLA uh, in, his, in his senior year. Um, you know, so, so many players, uh, and, and Rick was, you know, Rick was one of the pivotal guys, ABA, NBA guy, Billy Cunningham was an ABA, NBA guy, uh, was an MVP in the, in the ABA. Um, so, so we just had fun every night, man. We, we played, we, you know, we knew that we were the other league from the more established, uh, NBA, the NBA had been established in 1946. And now here it was the ABA 20 years later, you know, in 67, uh, getting established. And, you know, I missed those first few years because I was still in high school. But, you know, I got in, in in the last five years of the league. So from, uh, you know, from 73 uh, to 76 or 72 to 76, you know, I was an ABA player. And in and, 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 and the league, I – you, you probably experienced this in college, maybe in high school, where it was one for all and all for one. And anytime anybody in the, on the team got some publicity or got some notoriety, everybody fed off of it, you know, instead of what I later experienced in the NBA, where, you know, a lot of egos were involved. Everybody thought they were the best guy on the team. And, and uh, you know, if they had a good night, it's like, well, now I'm going to be the man the rest of the season, as opposed to, you know, what it was in the ABA where, you know, guys kind of knew their places and knew that they needed one another in order to be successful. And I think that's why my uh, New York Nets teams uh, were ultimately successful because guys really knew their roles. You know, the John Williamson to the world, Brian Taylor, and uh, Jumbo, Jim Akins, and, you know, the guys, the guys who I played with, and that's, it was, it was a beautiful experience. Um, and I, I, I'm going to say it wasn't quite as much fun when I, when I got to the 76ers. 
<laughs> you know, Daryl Dawkins used to say it, God rest his soul, he said, whoever got it, shot it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you, you may be uh, unsurprised to, to know this, but that not, not much has changed in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, there's still a problem with, uh, you know, 15 or now it's 17 with the two way players, but there's a problem with 15 egos mixing, you know, it's, 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 yeah. it's a lot of that, by the way, I just want to point out, Tommy, I caught a lot of flack this summer. I, I try to do one dunk shot. Um, I call it a dunk <laughs> shot as well. I caught a lot of flack this summer. I, I do a dunk shot every year for my birthday just to prove that I can still dunk. Oh, and I, I posted <laughs> something on social media, and I yeah. called it a dunk shot, and everybody thought I was crazy. You got, a lot, just of, so you got, a, lot clear, of, you got a lot of flack for that. <laughs> the greatest dunker ever just called it a dunk shot. I just want to point that out. I just want to point there that out. There you go. Hey, hey, man, you know, I, I um, after retiring and, you know, I got to my middle 40s or whatever, you know, I started that once a year dunk thing, and I did it to age uh, 63. And wow. 63 was such a rub in or whatever, I stopped doing it. So I'm 70 now. I mean, I'll be 71 next month, whatever. And people ask me, can you still dunk the ball? I said, well, with the proper training, the proper motivation, <laughs> you know. But uh, I haven't done the training, and nobody's given me the motivation to try to do it. I think that, this might be it for me. I think this might. I think thirty six is it. I'm good. You're gonna pack it in. <laughs> you had a good I'm run. I'm not gonna try. I'm not gonna try. <laughs> I forbid you get hurt. You know. <laughs> I know. I know. Doctor, I wanted to ask about Rucker for a second. JJ and I both uh, spend a lot of time in New York, and anyone who has has either lived in New York or spent a summer in New York, who's a basketball mm -hmm. fan, hopefully has been to Rucker in you know non COVID times. What were your uh, what were some of your favorite experiences from there in particular? Because, you know, tell me if you disagree with this, but it feels like you were uh, one of the primary reasons why it became, you know, the thing that everybody sort of mm. came to went to afterwards. I, I think I contributed to it, but, you know, there was the players side and then there was the each one teach one program where the administrators of the league, you know, a guy named uh, Bob McCullough, was, was uh, very su significant uh, and Holcomb Rucker, uh, legend in the Harlem community. Um, the other players who were there, I mean, everybody who was anybody, Tiny Archibald, Wilk Chamberlain, I mean, Willis Reed, uh, you know, guys from pro teams as well as community guys, uh, um, uh, Joe Hamilton, you know, the, um, the, the guys who were uh, schoolyard legends uh, always tried to step up, you know, and play better against, you know, the guys who were in the pros. And some of them just didn't have an avenue to uh, to get to the pros. But for the pros to show up there, Michael Jordan to show up there, and Kevin Durant of the world, and, uh, you know, people who feel like they wanted to have that experience, uh, the Rucker was the place to have it. You know, there's leagues in Chicago, there's leagues in Washington, there's leagues in California, so on and so forth. But the Rucker is like the godfather of, of summer league basketball. And, you know, it was, it was stated, uh, if you play like a bum in the Rucker League, you're always going to be a bum. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, <laughs> don't go there and play like a bum. So my first five years after college, uh, I made sure that on the weekends, that's where I was in the summertime, playing basketball in Brooklyn. I love that. I love that. JJ, have you ever played there? No, and I regret not doing it. I'm too old to do it now, but I regret not doing it. When I, when I was in high school, that was all, when all the N1 mixtapes were coming out. And then as mm -hmm. I got into college and early in my pro career, that's when like Kobe would come to the Rucker, Kevin yeah. Durant would come to the Rucker. Um, yeah. My buddy Mike Dunleavy did it one year. He lived in New York City. Yep. He did it one year. So, like, I, I wish I had done it. I regret not doing it. I think it would have been an amazing experience. My McDonald's All American game was in New York City, so we oh, did a whole. Right? We did like a whole day where we went to the Rucker. We went to the Apollo yeah. Theater. We got up on stage. It was great. JJ, what do you think the ideal uh, work life balance is for pro athletes, specifically pro basketball players? I think it's a, it's a great question. Thank because you. a lot of us are so obsessed with the game, and yet uh, there's a lot of pressure that comes with, with playing and with performing. There's a lot of people that you have to answer to. 
there's a lot of responsibilities that you have. Um, so you need to have outlets. Um, I always use the example actually uh, from The Alchemist, the story within the story about the boy who visits the castle. And when he gets there, the guy says to him, hey, walk around, see all the sights, see all the amazing artwork, uh, but don't spill any of this oil from the spoon. So the boy walks around the castle and he gets back and the guy says, what'd you think of everything? He says, I didn't see anything. I was too obsessed with the oil and the spoon. I didn't spill any of it. And he said, well, walk back around. It's okay if you spill a little bit of it. So in life, you need to be able to spill a little bit of that oil. Uh, and in sports, if you think joy only happens after you win, think again. Look at the world's most successful athletes. They don't spend all their days grinding away. They take the time to enjoy themselves. Like having a Michelob Ultra with friends because they know that happiness is the key to winning and that joy is the whole game. Not just the end game. Michelob Ultra, 95 calories, 2.6 grams of carbs. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Tommy, do you enjoy it? I do. I wish I had one right now. Same. Beginning January 29th, watch Academy Award winners Denzel Washington, Rami Malek, and Jared Leto in the psychological thriller The Little Things in theaters and on HBO Max on the exact same day. It's also available to stream at no extra cost to HBO Max subscribers. Plus, with HBO Max, you can stream the greatest collection of series and exclusive Max originals all in one place. Discover something new to watch, like the HBO original The Undoing the Max original, The Flight Attendant, and the new two-part HBO documentary, Tiger. Go to hbomax.com or download the app to sign up and start streaming today. The Little Things is rated R and is available to stream on HBO Max for 31 days from its theatrical premiere. Um, by, by, by 1976, I, I assume you kind of, I don't know how accurate the movie um, uh, with Will Ferrell and the Flint Tropics is, but I assume everyone kind of <laughs> knew that, that that the ABA and NBA merger was going to happen. And I, I was doing some some research on sort of how you ended up with the 76ers. And I, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting story in terms of uh, the logistics of the Nets joining the league and sort of the repercussions in, 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 in dealing with you and your contract and how you ended up with the Sixers. Mm-hmm. Kind of like how you ended up with the Sixers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the money, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> uh, economics uh, play a big role in, in basketball and in terms of uh, where you uh, end up laying your hat. So um, the Nets, we knew that the merger was was coming. Uh, we didn't know. I mean, it was, there were uh, 14 teams in the NBA and there were seven teams in the ABA. And uh, as it took out, as it turned out, <clears throat> four teams were, were taken in uh, from the ABA, which made it an 18-team league. And then the other three teams' players were dispersed throughout the, uh, the NBA. That's how Moses Malone ended up in Portland for, for a minute. And George McGinnis, uh, who had already gone to Philadelphia, was there. And, and, um, and then a lot of players... Uh, didn't get to make the transition. Some great players, you know, James Silas was was one of those. He was the guy they called Captain Late in in uh, in San Antonio. And at the end of the game, he and George Gervin are on the court, and most of the time Silas would have the ball and would take the last shot because <laughs> if he got to the foul line, he was either going to get fouled or he was going to score, or whatever. So he was he was a great ABA player, and. Um, so when we, we know this is coming, my agent and all his wisdom says, well, we, we need to renegotiate the contract. And uh, as it turned out, uh, Roy Bo, who, who owned the Nets, uh, said, I, I can't do that. And uh, then, you know, my agent basically started uh, shopping me in the metropolitan area. So it was Nick's and it was... Uh, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, you know, because I, I I spent my whole life in the Northeast, so I really wanted to stay uh, in the Northeast. And um, as it turned out, you know, uh, Pat Williams at Philadelphia uh, went to his owner, uh, who was uh, Irv Kosloff at that time, and he said, you know, I might be able to get us a player who's like, Babe Ruth was to basketball, <laughs> and, and Babe started in Boston and ended up with New York. So 
uh, owner told him to go ahead and, and see what he can do. And they put forth a $6 million deal, three to the Nets and three to me in contract. And then suddenly I became known as the $6 million man, even though I didn't get $6 million. <laughs> Got half of that and a five-year contract uh, with Philadelphia. And I, it, was, it was really hard for me to uh, leave New York. I had grown up there. The team was based on Long Island. And it was just it was just business at the end of the day. And when and when you're young, you know, the agent has a lot of influence over you because you think uh, he knows what's best. And I, I think if I had to do it all over again, I don't know how I would have <laughs> found a way uh, to stay put. But I think I would have stayed put. The Nets knew that if I went to the Knicks you know, that would just crush them of having any chances of uh, succeeding in New York. They were going to stay in New York, and actually they left New York and went to New Jersey uh, for a number of years and then came back to, to Brooklyn or whatever. But, yeah, the deal was not going to uh, work with New York. And there were infringement on territorial rights uh, that they already had done <laughs> by, by their existence uh, in the NBA and coming into the NBA. So they were just coming into the NBA and there was, there was this fee that they would have to pay. But just in terms of, you know, the validity of their franchise, if they let their best player go to the nearest competitor and plus they, was both, they were both playing in the same division, same conference or whatever, it, that was just something that was, was not uh, going to happen. So Philadelphia uh, became the option mainly for geographical purposes because I, you know, I just built a home in, in Long Island and uh, started a family. And uh, when I went to Philly, I actually commuted, you know, back and forth for a time uh, during that first contract. And so World Be Free and I, we we're going down the highway every day because he was commuting from Brooklyn. And I was commuting from Long Island. And uh, with the second contract, they required that I move to Philadelphia. <laughs> so the first contract was a commuting contract. The second one was, you know, move lock, stock, and barrel, you know, buy a house, build a house, but we need you here. And that's why I ended up playing, you know, 11 years in Philly and not playing for any other teams. I'm so happy. Tommy, how happy am I to hear I this? I was going to say... There, I can think of one other person who has made this, who has made the commute <laughs> from New York to Philadelphia. Too. I was commuting from Brooklyn, and I caught so much shit from a certain subset of Philly fans because I was commuting and not living in Philly. Yeah. But now that I know that you did it for a while, yeah, I just my, free, my guilt is gone. My guilt is gone. We were on that. We were on that turnpike all the time. <laughs> <laughs> if I have to drive on the New Jersey Turnpike one more fucking time, oh, it's it's a, it's a very tough commute. I it's a t it's two hours traffic or no, like it's it, it, good for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not great. It we is managed not great. it. Though. We managed it. We did. Uh, yeah. I want I wanted to ask you about the the eighty three team because okay. people talk a lot about the the greatest teams of all time, and there's mm -hmm. probably an argument to be made that that eighty three team was one of the the best teams ever. Um, you guys were 67 and 15. This is back when you used to play three rounds of playoffs. There wasn't a there wasn't a fourth <clears throat> round. So you were 12 and 1 in the playoffs. You swept the Lakers in the in the mm -hmm. finals. How where do, where do you think that team ranks amongst the greatest teams ever with let's say the, you know, 96 Bulls or the the 15 mm -hmm. 16 Warriors? Yeah. So there were four rounds in the playoffs, but if you won uh, your division, you had a buy. So there was still four rounds. So that's why, the, and now it's still 16, te uh, 16 games uh, to, to win it. <clears throat> but you could win it with 12 games, and we did it probably in most efficient fashion. Uh, I think as we went through that season, you know, we were, we were coming off uh, playing in the finals in 1980 and 1982. And uh, so we had almost all the pieces. We just couldn't get over the hump. And uh, you couple those two second place finishes with the loss to Portland my first year in Philadelphia and whatever. So now three times in six years, uh, we were playing for the championship. 
And uh, that summer, I went to China, uh, kind of on a missionary trip with Pat Williams, and seven, it was like 17 of us, and we all, you know, we went over to China, and uh, we found, uh, you know, kind of found ourselves uh, just in terms of our purpose and our purpose in the world and, and our place in the world and so on and so forth. And we realized how, how small and infinitesimal uh, we really were in terms of a global existence. And while on that trip, uh, our general manager, who was Pat Williams, uh, got a call from our owner, Harold Katz. <clears throat> and he said, while well, you're away with all the guys, uh, I just made a deal to get Moses Malone. <laughs> so it was like, what? <laughs> so, so ML Carr was one of the guys on the team, and he was with Boston, and ML was a former ABA guy too. And, you know, he was always, he always had something to say. <laughs> so the next thing I know, I'm looking at him, and I'm told him we got Moses Malone, and his jaw was locked. <laughs> he, did, he did not know what to say. And as it turned out, he was right. Uh, that was that was the missing piece for us uh, to get Big Mo and, and Maurice Cheeks went on record as saying, "Man, after after that first day of practice, now we gave up. You know, we gave up Caldwell Jones and Daryl Dawkins went to the Nets. Caldwell Jones went to Houston. Uh, we still had uh, Harvey Ketchum because we had three centers, <clears throat> and uh, and now we just had we just had Moses." And, you know, he was a workhorse. Uh, Cheeks said, he said, every time we practice, every time, every time we started a game, I just felt like we were going to win. Because uh, we had, you know, we had that guy who was the dominant player inside. And this was an era of, you know, dominant, uh, dominant players. Uh, centers had been the, uh, the MVP of the league since... Oscar Robertson was the MVP in uh, 1966. Uh, centers from 66 to 81 were MVPs. That was the year uh, you won, right? And then in 81, I became the MVP. MVP. And so after that, uh, centers still got their due, but forwards, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, so on and so forth, you know, they moved from centers to front court players <laughs> and, then, and now the guards dominate, right? So if a guard doesn't win it every year, then something's wrong, right? So uh, so we get Moses and we're going through the season and we're winning like 80% of our games, 90% of our games. And Billy Cunningham calls me in before the trade deadline. <clears throat> and he says, he says, Doc, you think we have enough to win the championship? And you know, I, I'm sitting on the second place ladder three years out of six after getting to the NBA and after coming off two championships in the ABA. And I said, Billy, I don't know. If you can get us any more help, get it. So he goes out and gets Clement Johnson as a backup center. And so it's Moses, Clement Johnson, and we had Earl Curid and, and, uh, and Mark McNamara. So we, now we have four centers. And he gets Reggie Johnson uh, to come in, and um, and he becomes the scoring forward off the bench. Because Bobby Jones was more defensive forward, so it's me, Mark Iberoni, and then we have uh, Bobby Jones, Hall of Famer, and then we have Reggie Johnson from the University of Tennessee. Uh, great shooter, plays his role, quiet guy, and then we have the four guards. You know, we have Cheeks and, and Tony and. Franklin Edwards and Clint Richardson. So we have an unusual makeup where it's four, four, and four instead of the conventional, you know, three, four, and five, or, or whatever the math is, the conventional thing is not four, four, four. But uh, that was a, uh, a term that was destined because when we got to the playoffs and they said, Moses, what do we need to do to win the championship? And he said, well, I have won the championship. You know, I didn't win it in the ABA. I have won it in the, in the, in the, in the NBA uh, yet, but we need to go fo fo fo. So that was coined. And as it turned out, 
you know, we lost one game to Milwaukee. I, I look back on that, um, and it was probably a winnable game. But we just Milwaukee just gave us such a hard time. Boston, you know, in the East at that in that era, it was Boston, Philly, and Milwaukee, and they were all equally talented and equally uh, caliber in terms of ratings or whatever. But you know, lo in losing that one game, I just I just said, well, you know, we gotta we gotta be one of the greatest teams of all time. And uh, and a lot of it was because of the bench, because, uh, you know, starters every now and then would start the second half and suddenly we look up and we're down eight points and guys are coming off the bench and the starters will go back in and we're up eight points <laughs> or whatever. So we had a really strong bench, we had a great chemistry. Um, and Moses was phenomenal. The Cheeks and Tony were equally phenomenal as teammates. And, um, you know, it was the best team I ever played on, for sure. Dr. J, I have a JJ and I were talking about this before you got on. It's kind of a broad question, but how do you think things would have been different for you uh, career wise in the internet age? In part, uh, based off just how you play, you know, and the and the excitement that you play on a on a game by game basis. Uh, but then also just dealing with things in the locker room, dealing with trades, dealing with player movement, with you know, with what sort of the guys have to go through now, where everything they do is analyzed for better or for worse all the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if uh, if the internet age had, had been around, you know, ESPN wasn't even around. Yeah. When I played, ESPN came afterwards, and, and uh, ironically, uh, I was. Uh, one of the co-hosts one year and went there and presented an award maybe to LeBron James or somebody when he first came into the league. And uh, a kid asked me, he said, Mr. Irving, you know, I know you were a great player. How many ESPYs did you win? <laughs> I was like, ESPYs? <laughs> and you have ESPYs when I played. <laughs> so I got a nice laugh out of that. But the, the whole internet age, I, I think, uh, economically, uh, I probably would be in a different stratosphere. Uh, I never had a problem uh, with media. I never had a problem with being uh, the team leader, uh, the guy doing interviews, being a spokesman for the franchise. Uh, I always felt as though, you know, I was representing my, my family and my community. Always, always felt that way. And I, I kind of credit my high school coach and my college coach for that because you know lots of days when when it was a day off uh from practice or whatever he'd drag me down to uh the, the ymca or the police boys club or or a school uh meeting of some kind and have me get in front of people and and speak and unprepared or whatever lots of times it was it was just off the cuff and uh and i think that Help me, and that certainly would have helped if it was the age of the internet, just in terms of you know posting things and responding to uh, the you know the communication. I, I'm sure you've heard the phrase "you you should never count another man's money" or something along those lines. Yeah. Players, specifically great players from your generation, what what do you guys make of current NBA salaries? Um, well, I, I think a lot of us take a lot of, uh, pride in the fact that, you know, we laid the foundation and, uh, there was a guy, Joe Caldwell, <clears throat> who was a NBA player, uh, for St. Louis Hawks and he left St. Louis and he, he came over and he played for the Carolina Cougars and, uh, and then he went to St. Louis, I believe. And he, he he did an assessment and he said, man, players, best players should be making $10 million a year. And this was this was in a time when nobody was making a million bucks. And as it turned out, he was right. <laughs> he was right in terms of the overall economics associated with it. And he and he had a he signed a contract. And instead of 50,000 as a bonus, there was a typo in it which said 500,000. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and he fought for it uh, with the typo, you know, said, 
in the playoffs, whatever, it will be 500,000, whatever. So next year he was out of the league. <laughs> and he got he got banned. Um, he got banned from from the ABA and from and from and from basketball. And it was it was kind of a sad story because this was a guy who could really see the future. And uh, and at some point in time in the future, you know, it was the first guy making 10 and then now it's 20 and now it's 40 or what have you. So the, the evolution of uh, salaries in, in basketball is a given, you know, it, it, or it's always gone up. It, it's never really gone down. And, uh, and I think the group ahead of the group that benefits from it or whatever, Oh, they should take some credit. There's no, there's no reason to be jealous. I mean, you know, you're talking about a, um, you're talking about a population of 500 people. You know, so uh, it's it's not like you're talking about millions of people who get this entitlement or whatever. It's a it's a select group, 500 or so, who uh, you know put the work in. And uh, and are deriving the the ultimate benefit, and they're just setting the stage for the next group. So uh, it's always going to go up. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to go down. The fact that uh, you know the percentage of the gross was uh, introduced through the uh, wisdom of the uh, players' association and and uh, retired players' association uh, or whatever. That's you know, if you got people fighting for you, right, right, right will always prevail. And, uh, you know, I think the owners, if they couldn't afford it, they wouldn't pay it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. You, you know, you, you talked earlier about the, this, the egos involved in the NBA and, mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, what are the byproducts and commissioner Stern is largely credited for this, but you know, one of the mm-hmm. byproducts of, having a, a, a league that is superstar driven. It's it's driven, you know, revenues, uh, media, ratings, mm-hmm. everything is driven by star players. And it's very hard for ego not to become involved in that because, mm-hmm. you know, the, the 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 more attention you get and and the more points you score, the more money you make. Um and Commissioner Stern came in, I believe, right around you know your last few years in the NBA. Did you get the sense, uh, you know, during that period of time in the '80s when it was about Magic and Larry and you, and then you know later on uh, Michael, that the league was really turning into a a individual, not an individual sport, but a, but really the emphasis was on the star player and not on the team. Uh, I don't think it ever shifted totally away. Uh, from the from the team, because basketball is a team sport, and you know there are <clears throat> you know there are great players uh, who are not champions, and they're stars. Um, you know they always use the Barkley example and Carl Malone and Patrick Ewing and so on and so forth, or whatever. And you know these guys were superstars, um, didn't win the title because. As Bill Walton told me once, well, you guys had the best player, but we had the best team. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> that year. <laughs> so uh, with it being a, a team sport, um, I think the fact that now you need three guys, maybe you need four guys, you know, who have elevated status, who are considered to be uh, a cut above uh, the rest in order to secure that title and the way that players uh, move around, you know, there's, there's a, um, the juggling act in, in terms of, you know, players recruiting their friends or, you know, su- super talented players to, to come and play for them. So it seemed like the bottom run teams are never getting the chance to catch up. You know, the draft, the draft isn't enough to, uh, to balance that out. So, you kind of see the same majority of the teams in the playoffs. If there's 16 teams in the playoffs, the majority of them are going to be teams that were in the playoffs the year before and probably the five years before. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, stars in all sports. I mean, if, if you're, 
if you're if you're an elite athlete and you're rewarded as such or whatever, that just makes you a bigger star because I, I, I get a little confused sometimes when all players are called legends and all former players are called legends because there's some people, you know, who just, you know, had a cup of coffee in the league. <laughs> whatever, so how's that guy become a legend? <laughs> <laughs> he just stopped there for a cup of coffee and then he was gone. So, uh, so the standards the standards have changed, and um, and because there's so many, hundred percent, you know, who have legend status. Now, if you're above that status in reality, based on your statistics, your performance, and your ability to be on championship teams and be the glue, be the man, and so on and so forth. Then you deserve the, the the elevated status. You deserve the, the lofty the lofty status. But I personally, I mean, I always and I free to lecture people and say you you're better you're better off as a person in life if you're success driven and not ego driven. You know, the ego driven person will at some time get his ego bruised. And the only thing that could uh, stop a success-driven person is to not be successful. And you know, as far as winning or losing is concerned, somebody's got to win. Somebody's not going to win. And so the term "loss" and "losing," "loser," or whatever they they've been erased from my vocabulary because you know you either succeed at something or you don't succeed at it, and just keep on pushing because being success-driven is a good place to be. It's a good way to be, and and being successful obviously is a good place to be. I think I think your your status of being a legend is warranted. You would agree with me on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I think I called you a legend at the beginning of this, and I I don't think I'm I don't think I'm off base on that. <laughs> There's a lot of company there. There's, there's too much company. <laughs> Tommy, it's that time of year. It's almost Valentine's Day. And the greatest love story ever told is the one between your butt and Hello Tushy. Because there's nothing more romantic than true love's kiss, aka a Hello Tushy spray to your butt. Now, the brand new Hello Tushy 3.0 modern bidet attachment is here to level the playing field. It's stylish, eco-friendly, easy to install, and affordable. It attaches to your existing toilet, requires no electricity or additional plumbing, and cuts toilet paper use by 80%. Again, we're talking about uh, Hello Tushy Bidet Spray. Do the math. The Hello Tushy Bidet pays for itself in a few months because with Hello Tushy, you don't wipe your butt at all. You just poop, spray, dry, and go. It's pretty pretty appealing. I love that process. This is one of my favorite processes of my day. Yeah, think about how much time you save. I know. Plus... Every Hello Tushy bidet attachment comes with a 60-day 60 60-day 60 risk-free guarantee and a 12-month warranty. It's a total no-brainer. Just think about it. Use your water to clean your body. Now, use it to clean your butt. And now, Tommy, for the rump, you love to hump. Did you come up with that one, JJ? I just did. I line? just came up. The rump, you God. love to hump. Uh, this Valentine's Day, give the gift of Hello Tushy. Go to hellotushy.com slash three T H R E E to get 10% off plus free shipping. So you get 10% off your butt spray plus free shipping. This is a special offer for our listeners. Go to hello tushy.com slash three T H R E E for 10% off. That's hello tushy.com slash three clean butts. All right. If you sell stuff online, you're definitely in the right business. More people are shopping online than ever. That means a lot of orders coming in and a lot of orders you'll need to ship out fast. That's why online sellers like you need ShipStation. No matter how much you sell, ShipStation makes it super easy to manage and ship all your orders from all of your sales channels faster, cheaper, and more efficiently. Import orders from any sales channel. Ship with any carrier, access discounted shipping rates, and automate just about any shipping task. You'll spend a lot less time on shipping and a lot more time growing your business, like our business, 342. Plus, ShipStation funnels all your orders into one simple interface that you can manage from anywhere, even your cell phone. So ship more in less time. Just use my offer code JJ to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com. 
click on the microphone at the top of the page and type in JJ. That's ShipStation.com. Enter offer code JJ. Make ship happen. You know that credit card. The one that you're afraid to look at to see what the balance is? Yep. Well, if you've been avoiding your debt like Tommy, it's time to confront it. Upstart can help you face it and finally pay it all off. Upstart is the fast and easy way to get a personal loan to pay off your debt all online. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get a simple fixed monthly payment. Upstart finds smarter rates with trusted partners because they assess more than just your credit score. For the five minute online rate check, you can see your rate up front for loans from $1,000 to $50,000. And you can get approved the same day and receive funds as fast as one business day. It sounds super easy. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash JJ. That's upstart.com slash JJ. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash JJ. Who was, who, who, was the, who was the best player you ever played against? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He's a... Uh, he was always in the way. <laughs> I just think that if I were going to start a franchise, and he's the guy I would start with. I probably would pick him as an ideal teammate. And, and you know, Moses used to eat him up. <laughs> he said, he, you know, Moses would always say, man, you know, Kareem never outplayed me. We went on, one-on-one, I said, but the game wasn't one-on-one. And he played 22. They both played 20-some-odd years whatever, but he probably would be the guy if I were going to uh, start my franchise. So I have to acknowledge him as the best player that I played against. Who was the best guy you played against? Oh, that's so far. Uh, I, LeBron, LeBron, LeBron. It's yeah. like LeBron and Kevin Durant and then, and then yeah. Kobe. LeBron, like those are the best players I think from my, from my era. Yeah. Good. Good picks. Who are the young guys when you're watching the league now that you, uh, you know, we're not calling them legends because they haven't gotten there yet. But <laughs> but that but that you look at yeah, that you look, legends, at, yeah, you, that you look at and you're just intrigued by. You're just interested in, yeah. in for whatever reason. I, I love watching Kawhi. Uh, going back to his days in San Antonio, you know, I was a big Tim Duncan fan, and uh, and and San Antonio having their roots in the ABA, you know, was created a bias for me. So, uh, you know, when Kawhi came on the scene and then he was MVP in the playoffs, um, you know, I, I started watching him more closely. And I like, I like what he brings to the table. Uh, I like, you know, a lot of people don't like his demeanor, but I, I love his demeanor, you know. <laughs> he says something when he has something to say. <laughs> if he got nothing to say, <laughs> go talk to somebody else. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, he would he would be at the, the top of my list. I know you've I know you've been asked about this before, but for our listeners, could you walk us through the infamous fight with Larry Bird from from 1984? Was that a fight? <laughs> Scuffle. All I know, there were hands thrown. There were hands thrown, Doctor J. There were hands thrown. It was it was like a little melee, you know. And, 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 and interesting, I mean, Larry and I, we, we, we had a legitimate rivalry. Uh, you know, he, he came in after John Havlicek was there for many years, and John and I were friends. And we, in the summer, we used to, you know, go down to the Bahamas and, and have fun, play golf. And, and you know, we were cool. And, I, and, and when I would go to Boston, I would always, uh, there would be a little red, Number six up in the up in the rafters somewhere because I went to school at UMass, whatever. And Red Albuck used to always say, "Ah, you the guy that got away. You should have been a Celtic and so on and so forth." So uh, and Larry and I, um, it was Larry, Marcus Johnson, Adrian Dantley, and there were uh, a few guys who were the heir apparent to my position, <laughs> which is small forward. <laughs> And uh, so it was always tough, you know, playing against, playing against them because, you know, it seemed like they were next in line and they wanted to you know, force me out 
because I was reigning small forward in the league, uh, all pro, you know, first team, so on and so forth. So, uh, so with Larry, uh, it was evident that he could play big forward or small forward. And there was uh, no, no limit to the things that he could do on the court. He just did them at a different pace uh, than others. So he wasn't deterrent, decided to be quick, but he was really adept in, in, in what he did. And, um, and, and, and we, I call him a complainer. <laughs> so there are a lot of people call him a trash talker and whatever. And I wasn't really into trash talk. So, you know, I, I would say, there he is complaining again, or whatever, you know. And, and so we go down, we go down on, uh, on offense. And I'm on defense, I'm on him, and the call doesn't go his way. So I immediately run down court because we got the ball now. So when I run down the court, he is coming down court, and he's coming right like towards me, like he's pissed. <laughs> so, so I'm like, this is an exhibition game, isn't it? <laughs> so I think it was like preseason. So um, I thought he was going to hit me. I mean, I really did. I really did. And I reached out and I just kind of tried to hold him at bay. And I had him like in this chest area. And I guess my hand kind of slid up on his neck <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you have situations. Sure, you have situations like this, right? Sure. <laughs> so. So I do that, and then he reaches over, and now next thing I know, he's got my neck, <laughs> and, and we're holding each other. And I don't even know what happened. All I know is, you know, I threw three jabs and got thrown out of the game, and he got thrown out of the game, and we got fined. And then when I see the video, I see uh, Moses is like the first to the scene. <laughs> <laughs> he like grabs him and you know the benches clear out and the whole deal but in a melee like that you know everything happens so quickly i mean this is all five or six seconds and what you goes but uh, suddenly it could live forever and then suddenly people started selling pictures at the mall <laughs> or trying to get autographs on the fight between me and larry bird which of course i'd never dignified any of them because we were boys in terms of Converse. We were both, you know, promoting Converse together. We, we, I think we had a commercial scheduled <laughs> for close to that time, either in Boston or, or in Philly. And, you know, this is when he did the take two of these and call me in the morning uh, commercial. And, uh, and, and we did, um, uh, yeah, we did the, uh, the video game. We did the video game together. Uh, I played that video game. The one-on-one -on -one yeah. video game. Yep. So, yeah. Tommy Tommy wasn't born yet when that game came out. Tommy, um, Tommy wasn't born then. <laughs> was he wasn't not, born when that game even, came out. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we we appreciate the time, um, and you and you are a true legend, and we appreciate everything you've done for for the game. Uh, this has been uh, amazing to chat with you. Really appreciate it. So you heard my wife calling me to dinner, didn't well, you? Well, we were wrapping up anyway. We were wrapping <laughs> up anyways. Hey man, you're a legend too. Keep on going. Keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you, Doc. All around. All right. Hopefully Thank see you. you soon. Peace. Later, guys.